Using edges within our paintings is an entirely fascinating subject matter. And I really want to share it with you. There's some very interesting ideas that we're just about to get into and I cannot wait to explore it. But this all comes from a small section of my oil painting class where we start to talk about edges. Uh, this is the first section. We're kind of going through the ideas. And then in the second section, in the actual course itself, we're going to be working through how to then manipulate our edges with oil paint. If you're interested in that, I, I would love you to come along. You can either take one of our live runs of the course or you can go and get it and do it at your own pace. Uh, in either case, let's talk about edges. Here we go. So naturally, as we talk through edges, uh, we are going to start somewhere completely different, which is how much time does it take to experience a painting? This is going to be a really weird question, uh, a little left field, but it actually it has a lot of bearing on edges, right? I promise it comes back, it comes all the way back. But how much time does it take to experience a painting? Uh, when I first started painting, I, I asked this question because I have a feeling that it's important. And the answer everybody would give me was well, just immediately. You look at a painting and there is a painting and you see it. You just experience it in one moment. And, and I found that to be a very interesting idea. And, and it's also false. It's, it's wrong. But this, what I'm presenting to you, these three squares, they might be the closest thing we have to just experiencing a painting in a moment uh, because everything is prioritized exactly the same. Everything demands our attention in exactly the same fashion, but we're, we're going to play around with this idea, right? How much time compared to those three squares did it take to work through this? Uh, I want you to take note of what your eyes do naturally without forcing them to. I want you to take note of how your brain sees this and categorizes things. Here we have the three squares. We come on in here, and suddenly our attention is drawn to the thing with the highest contrast. This isn't speculation. This is science. Um, we, we know this. This is uh, survival mechanisms. The things with the highest contrast take uh, our, our greatest attention. And then we have the option to look through the other things that have lower contrast. And so we go straight to that black square um, as we're soaking it all in. And then we look through the rest of these gray squares. And that's really interesting. We find this is true, not just of an abstract like this, but also in a painting, the areas that have the greatest difference. And that difference doesn't have to be value. We can, we can be a difference in color, a difference in something. But when something is different, when something has the highest contrast, it really takes our attention. Would your eye goes first, probably to, to this um, black square. How much time did it take? Well, it probably didn't take much time, but there was a, there's a bit of a sequence to it, more so than just those three squares straight. And so I want you to really work through these kind of things yourself, right? I can tell you it, but, but what I want is you to have your own conviction about how these work. By, by just having your own experience, look at a painting. Where do your eyes go to first? And, and you'll find that there's a, there's a sequence, right? So something like this, again, there's, there's three different squares. There's different amounts of contrast, there's black on white and then gray on white and then really soft gray on white. And, and you, even in the way that I spoke about those, there's this sort of a difference in, in how they feel and how they come across. And so this is a bit abstract, but we're going to look through a painting. How do we, how do we actually use this information? Uh, it's at the moment, it's very intellectual but we want to make it experiential. So I want you to look through this painting. This is a painting about St. George and his dragon by Solomon J. Solomon. I absolutely love this painting. If you haven't seen his work, please go ahead and find it. It's just stunningly beautiful. I'm, I'm a huge fan. He's dead, <laughs> poor guy. But, but it, it was a good painting when he was alive. As we, as we look through this, where do your eyes go through first? Write that answer down. Just, just write it down. We don't have to uh, pretend that there's a rule. And then I want you to Kind of figure out why did your eyes go there first? And there's more than just value. In fact, we're just about to explore that. There's more than just value contrast, uh, but, but that really does guide us. Also human things, faces and, and hands, these things take your attention as well. And so have back to our three squares, back to going through now we sort of the experience of it is a little disjointed. We, it happens over time, even short periods of time and then full sequences of how we experience an image. 
And the next idea that we're going to take through the Selman, J. Selman painting is that we can actually have information inside of these shapes that we're experiencing that don't necessarily take up much more time. So for example, on the far right, we have a blank square. In the middle, we have a square that's got some squiggles in it. It has texture, but that's, it's such low contrast that it doesn't really take our attention very much. High detail, but it doesn't take our attention. And then on the left, the contrast between the squiggles and the background is, is greater and our eyes are drawn to it more. So again, we're kind of getting this higher contrast takes more attention, but also that you can have areas in a painting that in fact don't have all, all, all that much attention. So as we look at this, there are whole areas in the painting. So for example, the top right, the mountain back there, there's lots of detail, but there's very little contrast. As painters, we're habitually, I, I don't know why, but you know, when we first begin, we're habitually trained in, in, in attempting to just put everything everywhere all at once, just screaming for attention, all the way black to all the way white, just working our way through that. And that might be an exaggeration for where you are, uh, but it's still a, a very much a habit. You know, everything down below, below his waist has very little contrast, except for maybe where that, that spear is going through the dragon's face. And then you have the question, well, why is that? Why did, they, did he put that shine right there? Because there's moments in that spear where it kind of gets lost. The edges blur into the other things, the values blur together. And so we, he wants that attention on what St. George is doing. And so he puts high contrast there. You know, that white, that almost white is right next to just about black. And it's a small moment, but it's a moment. And that's the thing. And so as we look through here, we have this idea, right? Of, of detail inside of these spaces. For example, in some of his armor, there wasn't much going on. Well, there's a lot of texture, but there's not, not much contrast. And so, so we take this and then we have this idea that, that we need to start being cognizant of, which is we have these shapes and these shapes have integrity. Even though they have detail inside of them, they're still just in our kind of our, in our mind, they're still just, that's the shape right there, that big square. And then the square is being described by the squirrels the texture of the square, maybe some of the, the form inside the square, but it's a square that's being described by the squiggles. When we add high contrast into these scenarios, suddenly the integrity of that shape is broken. And I know this is a bit abstract here, but hear me out. Let me plant the seeds of, of these ideas. We're creating a completely new shape inside of our other shape. So now we have, you know, now we have six shapes instead of three. Whereas you can also have that detail without creating a completely new shape. It just reads as being the one shape being described by the texture. Now we have a completely new shape. And so this is interesting for us because this, this is about our attention and where our attention goes inside of a painting. How much attention is really being stolen? I say stolen, but it's not really stolen, but it is being commanded. As artists, this is what we're doing. We're telling a story with our painting. We are commanding attention. And we're gonna get to why this is, why this is natural for us here in a minute. And then we're gonna add a new element. Our new element that we're adding in this is edge quality. So I've, I've got my edge, I told you we'd come back around to it, I told you. And so here we have a sequence. We have this sequence earlier. Black, not quite black, gray, where before our eyes were being led around by contrast and values. But now we're subverting this idea by introducing a new variable. And that variable is edge quality. We're going and actually right now, what is in focus for us, what's easy to look at for us, the guiding of our eyes around this uh, painting, it hits to the, the highest contrast thing first. That's, that's for, this is my experience that I'm describing. I understand it's subjective and everyone's experience is going to be different, but I, I hit that highest contrast. And then instead of going to the second highest contrast shape, I, I go to that, the, the, the lowest contrast shape. And even I hold those two things together in my head and my eyes want to slip off of that kind of slightly out of focus painting. This is very natural 
for us. And here's why. I want you to grab your hand, put your thumb up, stick your thumb out at full arm's length and look at your thumbnail. That is one to 2% of your entire field of vision and represents what is in focus for you at any given point in time. And our brains interpret things, but you only ever have one to 2% of your field of vision in focus at any given point in time. This is naturally what happens to us. And so, you know, in this image here, we have the fovea, that's our one to 2%. Then we have our blend that's out here. Sure, it's a little bit more in focus. And then we have the peripheral, which is just not in focus at all. And this comes to me like it just makes sense, but it also comes as a bit of a surprise when you first think about this and realize this, and it has big implications for our painting process and practice. If for no other reason, then this is the way humans see. And so when we're gonna contrast that to something like cameras. Cameras don't have a fovea. They don't have this little spot in here that has focus. Cameras have a focal plane. It says focal point down there, but it really means focal plane. And what that means is that everything at a set distance away from that camera, at that set distance, everything's in focus. Closer to us, out of focus. Further away from us, out of focus. It's just a distance. And that's different from having a fovea, having one to 2% of your field of vision. And so th this is why one of the reasons why photographs just they're good, but they don't actually emulate the human experience of seeing something. Yeah. And so here we, we've got some more demonstrations that we're going to work through, right? Here is our, our three squares and, and this, they're all black. The, the, the contrast is the same, but the edge quality is not. And it, it, my, my, my eyes just snip, snap onto that middle one. And then they go to the, the left one. This is kind of like, this is emulating the fovea. Now we don't need to do the whole thing necessarily where it goes from completely in focus to completely out of focus. My goal is never quite to emulate that, but instead to have moments that feel natural because they're, they're high contrast, which means they're going to demand our attention to some degree and they're in focus moments of high detail and then moments that aren't high contrast and, and moments that aren't um, high detail. But what I want to show again is that we're going from this idea of moving your focus around to again, having a sequence. The sequence is important because it, it, you actually end up exploring this painting in a different way. Now, you probably don't want to, to be that out of focus with the things that you're painting. Probably uh, there are some uh, masterful painters who are and who do. And so it's, it's not about right and wrong. It never is. It's just about function. What happens? How do we perceive and how do our eyes really work through this? It's about perception. And this is a thing we're doing in our paintings. Like I said, it doesn't need to be this grossly large. I'm, I'm not sure if this is going to translate very well. Um, because I, I don't know the resolution, but there is an edge in this painting that is a really hot edge. And the other edges in this painting aren't quite as hot. Now they're not soft necessarily, but they just have a touch of feathering. And so what you, I, I'll tell you in a minute, I want you to take a guess as to which edge that is. Uh, but it, it's, it's this one in the middle. It's the right edge of the middle square is in focus and everything else is slightly out of focus. And so the point I want to make with this is that we don't have to be grossly absurd with, with dealing with our edges. Now, again, you might want to be and all the power to you um, because that's a really fun thing to explore. But what I want to share is just there is, even if the difference in edge quality in your painting is only fractional, we're still leading the eye around. And so as I'm working on a painting, I'm always, I have a focal point. And then I say, I want you to look here. And then I want you to look there. And then I want you to look there. And I, I don't need to map out the complete sequence of what's going on, but one or two or three of these moments of clarity, one with high contrast and high detail first. And then slightly less for that second one, slightly less for that third one. And then we, we get to explore the experience of a painting. Does it, how long does it take 
to look at a painting, you can see that we can actually make a painting take a long time to look at um, and, and hide detail. Things that your eyes want to slip off of because the edge quality is doesn't have that hold on you or things that are really low contrast. So you're just not going to see them in, in that first viewing where eventually you're going to go through that sequence and eventually you're going to find these little spots. And again, it's all subjective. We can't guarantee that somebody's eyes are going to do exactly the sequence we, we, we think of. But again, this is emulating the human experience of seeing rather than the camera's experience. Um, and, and, and this is again, why the cameras don't always work and why hyper realism doesn't always work because it's not as kind of innately resonant with us because when we're looking around, we have this stuff and you have moments and these moments are, that are going to grab you and moments that are going to lose you. And there's a mystery and a beauty in all of that. So we want to have a look at this again, diving into the Solomon J. Solomon painting that I love so much. And what I want to look at is, you know, it's very tempting for us to, to think about things in terms of it. Look at these arms, these two arms of this woman. And it's tempting to want to try and do them the same to, to really have the same experience in terms of edge quality and everything. But, but this arm that is down here is so much tighter than that arm up there. And, and, and this is because this is this down here is the focal area. This is where your eyes are really being drawn to this high contrast, this high detail, this, the edges are straighter, right? We feel like we need to make straight edges all the time. And the further I get into painting, the more I realize we just don't have to. That's a, that is a perfectionism that, that we don't have to achieve. And in fact, we can do good things by not achieving it. And so looking at that arm that is, that is up there, this is a gorgeous painting. And the arm is just all over the place in terms of the line that's describing it. And the edge quality is pretty loose. And so when we're looking at these things, we don't need to treat them the same, but we're saying, Hey, look, even looking at the hair against, against the arm, that's high contrast, right? And so bringing an, an edge that is a little more dubious, it, it's not completely straight. There's texture to that edge. And that's, that actually kind of lowers the contrast a touch. We look at back here again, um, where really these three areas are all the same material. And so it would be tempting to, to give them the same edge quality. But so for example, that edge up on her shoulder, up on the top on her shoulder, it, it's almost because it's a part of the sequence of high detail. It, we, we follow that sequence and everything's in focus. We had this high detail and, and sharp edge quality. But the interesting thing is that down there in the, the middle circle, it's the same material, but it's been like, completely blurred. It's just like that edge is a lot softer. And it's because it's not a part of that sequence of, uh, of that high detail and grabbing our attention. Uh, he wanted to, to have our attention kind of slip by, but he didn't want to, it didn't want to lower the, the values or, or raise the values so that there's less contrast between the background and, and that piece of fabric. So he blurs that edge so that just like we experienced with those squares, your eye can see it and recognize what it is, but it doesn't quite want to stay there. It wants to go elsewhere. And then we have that fabric at the bottom. Why is that a hard edge? That's a hard edge because there's less contrast. He didn't need to do that. And so just having less contrast means that our eye, well, they're going to slip away from there rather than sort of being drawn to that sharp edge, high contrast. And so the interesting thing is that these edges, they have a certain degree of contrast, right? So we have, I have white on black, like our previous one did. And when we blur that edge, we're kind of creating distance between pure white and pure black. This is blurring it by either making it this really smooth gradient or by adding a bunch of texture as they interact. And the moment by moment contrast difference between kind of millimeter by millimeter of our painting is lowered 
because it's a gradual movement rather than a, a clean straight like black to white. And so in either cases, uh, especially when we're talking about this part of edge work, it's about contrast. It's about the way that, that our attention is being directed by the contrast. Here, we're gonna look at this, this Bouguereau painting. Uh, we're, we're just gonna do this a, a little bit. So the other thing that we can do is change our edge quality by the nature of the material that we're, we're communicating about. So for example, if you were here, you were looking at this girl and you could get this hair, right? This hair, look at it, you get closer, you get closer, you get closer. And the more you get closer, the more detail you see. And so if you had a photograph, you would see wiry hair. You could see the little, very particular pieces of hair. And we have a couple of them around, but even those have very soft edges because that soft edge actually describes the hair. We can use our edge quality to describe the nature of the material that we're painting. And, and even though you would be accurate by putting in every single little hair, by just putting it in there, it wouldn't feel right. It wouldn't feel the same. It would only feel that way if we were looking actually at the hair rather than looking at her face. And since we're looking at her face, since that is our focal point, for kind of probably for the very first glance. And then it probably goes to, you know, the hand. For me, it goes to the hand down uh, by her belly. And then up here, there's this sequence we talked about, about high contrast and, and sharp edges. But at, at no point do we really want to be analyzing this hair. And so we're kind of recognizing that it's outside of the fovea, that one to 2%. Um, and then we, we look at the, the clothing um, this is an area very interesting where there's really high contrast. That white is really the lightest part of the whole painting. We have this white right here. And then there's right next to it, there's whatever's in the background. And so that has the potential to be really high contrast. But Buguro does this interesting thing where he almost makes it feel like it's glowing by putting that edge almost like a gradient coming off that edge. You know, in animation, you'd call that bloom, where there's this slight gradient just enough so you don't really grab a hold of it as an effect in and of itself. But it that moment by moment lowering of contrast so that, that just doesn't take our attention quite so much. And instead, it is the inside of the clothes. When we get to see inside down, down here, kind of by her, her shoulder, we get a really hot edge in there. But on the outside, we're, we're scooting away from high contrast and, and really hot edges. And we get that every time we look into the clothing, we get that really hot edge, but outside of the clothing, not because we don't want our attention there. Um, and, and then what I wanted to say before we sort of continue this is that it's not all intellectual. I, I've given you lots of reasons and ways to think about it. And, and some, you know, if this is the first time you've heard these ideas that can be overwhelming. Uh, as well as we have now some ideas to guide us for why we might want to do it and when. And by do it, I just mean like loosen the edges or get a really hot edge. And the other thing is it just looks good. <laughs> and this is the golden rule of art, right? Where if it looks good, it is good. And, and there's a feeling to it. It feels more like a dream. It feels more um, escapist or you know, there's, I'm sure you could come up with a whole bunch of reasons why it just feels good. And, and so we want to explore this and you'll find so many artists in the history of art really working through different edges and that there's a, there's a function to it, but it's also just aesthetic. It also just looks good. And we want to play with that. If you made it all the way through that, congratulations. That was a lot of different things to think about. Now I have a whole bunch of online courses that you are welcome to come and join. You can join them either when we run them during a live run, or you can buy them and work through them at your own pace. Check out the links below, but in the meantime, feel free to try one of these videos.